they, um, uh, she's been uh, in a number of different things in the industry, and uh, including on uh, uh, staff and teaching roles. And she has a unique ability not only to understand uh, the whole genetic perception, but to explain it very well. And you can ask her a question, and I do that often. That's really sounds pretty stupid, but. She makes me think that it's really a brilliant question and uh, it needs an answer and, uh, and by the time she's through, I feel pretty good about the question I asked and didn't know the answer to. So, Dr. <laughs> Sally Northgate, thanks. Thank you, Rex. There are no stupid questions, <laughs> none. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, Bean Wilson, Tanya Heyman have done a tremendous job setting the stage for allowing me to visit with you a little bit today about the genetic improvement angle. I know we've got uh, purebred and commercial producers and there's a little bit in here uh, for everyone in terms of the selection tools that are available to you to make genetic improvement. And today the key focus is going to be that performance data matters, performance records matter. And I'll show you how that fits into the backbone of the genetic prediction models, your EPDs essentially that come out of that. Uh, for the purebred breeders here, how many of you all submit like weights, measures to the association, turning those in? Super. And those in the genomic world now, those pieces of information become more and more important. So I want to share with you some of that. There won't be a test <laughs> on this, but uh, you've already had some great discussion in terms of thinking about available selection tools. Uh, we've talked about uh, heterosis component as part of the discussions, and you've seen that common thread throughout the discussion. And, <laughs> And I've had the pleasure of working quite a bit with the Charlay Association on national cattle evaluation and those updates and the selection tools or your EPDs, your TSI, those types of tools that come out of national cattle evaluations. So uh, Tanya did a nice job, Bain as well, in terms of breaking down perhaps rules of thumb <coughs> or uh, heritability estimates, and these become the backbones of those breeding value estimations or the EPDs that we're driving at that have been around. I mean, the theory goes back <coughs> into the 70s, and we see more and more refinement of how we generate those predictions, those EPDs, indexes, accuracies. And so reproduction, more lowly heritable, uh, carcass traits more highly heritable. When that heritability is larger, it's easier to make uh, that selection progress. And so we've talked about that quite a, a bit today, but I want you to keep in mind, uh, particularly on the end, I'll add on some new trait development that the association's doing. And so keep those general categories in mind. Uh, when we think about the variation in a trait, say you're collecting weaning weights, uh, there's a genetic piece and then uh, that environmental piece. And as purebred breeders submitting uh, that information to the association, it's critical that you keep in mind, you know, what's the particular environment uh, where the data were collected. So for weaning weight, that trait's about 30% heritable. So uh, breaking that down, there's a huge environmental piece, and you're familiar with that, whether it's <coughs> creep-fed, management, uh, age of dam, nutrition, whether all the, the non-genetic components that can impact what you ultimately see on the scales when you collect those weights and report them to the association. And so I kind of call that blue section kind of the nuisance variation. And when we want to drive in to get the genetic component, uh, we want to not overlook what's there and account for that appropriately. Well, in the advent of DNA technology and the excitement of the growth in this area and also the implementation of DNA technology into your genomic enhanced EPDs that are provided to you through the association's national cattle evaluation, we sometimes get so caught up in the DNA hype that we forget 
that performance information that you're submitting to the association is extremely critical, particularly with the new approaches, new models that are utilized to generate your EPDs. And this is just some examples of some blood cards, for example, some tissue sampling tubes. Uh, when we run the particular national cattle evaluation for uh, the Charlet breed, we actually break down these SNP genotypes. That DNA sample you're collecting can be broken down into actually a file that's just zero, ones, and twos, so we can tie in that genotypic information into your national cattle evaluation. So, so this is fun and exciting. But the message I'm here to deliver today is not to forget about the backbone of information that goes into your genetic prediction tools. The genetic evaluation at the, the Charlet Association, uh, you heard this mentioned earlier, single step genetic evaluation. And it's exciting that the association released their first genetic evaluation under this model in December of 2017. And it's a very straightforward analysis in terms of incorporating those genotypes or the, the genetics that come back from the labs after you've run a test through the association into those EPDs directly. I'm going to show you those components. It's very modern and industry relevant. Other species have utilized this approach. It's utilized in seed stock populations and commercial genetic evaluations as well. So big picture, big picture. We're not going to drill down in terms of any math, but just some big buckets of information that go into a single step genetic evaluation. So you have traditional pedigree information, like what you see on a performance registry. Uh, typically, you fit about four generation pedigrees into uh, those mixed model procedures. Your DNA results, you'll hear those called that casually, uh, genotypes, SNP genotypes. And then your performance data, which is contemporary groups of animals managed and treated alike, exposed to the same environmental conditions. And then you have pedigree uh, progeny information coming in as well, of course. <coughs> that are contributing back to those parents and, and other ancestors and descendants. So you'll hear the terminology called genomic enhanced EPDs or GE EPDs. All of these are relevant pieces. And so today we're just again revisiting the impact of this performance data piece. <laughs> Again, just another breakdown, performance data, SNP genotypes, or that DNA result that comes back, uh, traditional pedigree. Well, how this actually works is you're familiar with a pedigree, paper pedigree, what you see on a registration paper. The SNP genotype actually <laughs> augments or fills in some of the gaps in a sense. It helps us to differentiate between embryo transfer calves, for example. With a paper pedigree, we think on the average they have half their genes in common, but realistically it might be a little more than that, a little less than that. Fitting those SNP genotypes gives us that refinement to improve the reliability of the genetic predictions or EPDs coming out of this system. It's better than the previous models that we've had access to and that we're using the genotypes directly, not a molecular breeding value that's derived from a calibration, so you don't have to have a calibration update. Again, I mentioned the genomic pedigree being part of this. And once that genotype is in the national cattle evaluation, then each time that update is run <coughs> by the genetic provider for the association, then those results are going to be reflected in your EPD updates. So very much genotype based, good science behind it, used in other species, very relevant in moving forward. So again, big picture, how does this work? Well, the technology in terms of generating your EPDs goes back <coughs> historically in what you might hear called BLUP, or Best Linear Unbiased Prediction, how we get to those EPDs. And it simultaneously combines information 
those phenotypes, weights and measures in proper contemporary groups, pedigree from an ancestral basis as well as a genomic pedigree that I mentioned. A nice bonus is when this information is available, the parentage can be checked as well. So that's an added bonus that's available to you now through the association. It works in seed stock data. It works in commercial data as well. So the math really isn't new, but the DNA piece provides a refinement. But sometimes we get so caught up in the DNA piece, we forget about maybe we worry, should we still collect scan data, ultrasound scan data? Should we still uh, weigh the calves at yearling? And my big message to you today, if you don't remember anything else, is that performance data matters, and we still want that data submission. So in terms of thinking about those performance measures and the association data reporting, I can't encourage you enough in terms of those birth and weaning records, calving scores, and I think you all do an excellent job of reporting that. You turn in calving ease data on first calf heifers as well as the birth records. Weaning contemporary groups, you do a nice job of that. You've got opportunities to specify management and group codes. When I look at your all's database and reporting, I see a weaker spot in terms of turning in yearling weights, those types of measures. So if I could get you to take that next step and maybe report more yearling weight data, that would be particularly important. We talked about moderating size and those growth, rate, growth traits being moderately to highly heritable. Uh, Tanya mentioned mature size, cow size, Bain did as well. And so moving forward and growing uh, the depth of your breed association database, I, I really think it'd be nice to, to step up the yearling weight component and maybe futuristically we could look at uh, collecting some young female weights, uh, cow weights as well. Uh, scan data, there's still scan data turned in and I get that question, well, with DNA, should I still scan them? I think that's a nice correlated trait to continue to include, and you all do a nice job of reporting that as well. Uh, we talked a lot, uh, our previous speakers, Brian Bertelson particularly, about harvest data. This, if you want to get aggressive in our industry, you need to try to capture as much individual carcass harvest data as possible because that becomes the economically relevant trait. That ultrascan scan data is an indicator trait of that carcass merit. All these components are, are quite relevant. The key is that they're properly reported. Uh, performance records need to be submitted in that proper contemporary group and that comes back on the breeder submitting the data. So that's what makes it useful in terms of the single step genetic evaluation. So never before have I seen performance records becomes so much more important now as we've moved to this uh, advanced single step model. Uh, Tanya mentioned a lot about visiting with your customers and in terms of capturing carcass data that can be really important in building those relationships of sharing information and seeing what your cattle do at that end product and working with your customers. <coughs> So considerations for contemporary grouping, uh, it's not a point to be ignored. Uh, different environments kind of become obvious to us in some respect in terms of reporting data, but think through with those cattle managed and treated alike. Also in terms of perhaps recipient females, uh, we're going to ask a little more detail in terms of those females breed composition so that can be appropriately incorporated into the evaluation models. So in terms of contemporary grouping, just classic basic definitions, animals, same sex, managed alike, treated alike, exposed to the same environmental conditions so that they have equal opportunity to perform. So we have individual measures on a set of animals managed and treated alike, same sex, 
reporting those individual performance records. And depending on the trait, when that national cattle evaluation is run, there's various contemporary group definitions, and those are handled uh, computationally, working from the data that you've submitted either online or with forms. And, and I've just generalized so that some of those contemporary group definitions, they vary by trait, but of course there's a breeder code. Uh, gender will break contemporary groups, of course. Uh, percentage breeding, birth year, there's a season adjustment, birth management, <coughs> uh, weigh dates, of course, you report those with the phenotypic data you turn in. Manager, past, management and pasture codes, uh, you specify those back to your operation. And then I mentioned the recipient female, because she becomes a, in an ET program, she becomes that third <laughs> parent, and so her information is relative, relevant as well. One thing not to forget, uh, not all groups are created <laughs> equal is one way of thinking about it. You can have the same ranch, like in this example, but there's calves that are really under different environments and so should probably be grouped appropriately. I also get the question about the the age of dam component. I mean, we use age of dam adjustments, but if you know you have a set of calves out of first calf heifers that have definitely been managed differently, then those need to be grouped accordingly. Or if your help has managed them differently, we see examples like that as well. But the proper grouping is, is very important. You know those groups of one that come in, they don't contribute to the genetic prediction system and are edited out. So in terms of genetic evaluation updates at the association, on the website they'll put a specific date of when the performance and the DNA results cut off back from the lab, what that date will be specifically, for example. But the next one coming up, uh, fall 2018, uh, we had the mid-year evaluation in 2018, about early May, so that next one's in 2019. The spring evaluation data cutoff is sometime in November, and those EPDs are released in late December. So you need to become a, you know, kind of a planner, particularly when you're working with collecting DNA samples and wanting those results to be back in time to go into your update. You know, I, I tell folks to you know, allow four weeks. That allows, because the clock doesn't start ticking really until the lab has that sample to begin to run it. It's not when you necessarily drop it in the, the mail service. So think about those particular cutoff dates, not only for reporting the weights and measures, but also uh, with your genomic tests. Um, how many of you all are submitting uh, DNA samples right now to participate in turning in genomic results? Yep, yeah, we got a couple. So I think we're going to have more and more interest in that as an additional piece of information to enhance the reliability of your EPDs. You'll get an accuracy bump from that additional test, and so that adds value and relevance to the predictions in characterizing uh, your cattle. So keep those releases in mind. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in uh, the Breed Improvement Committee in terms of adding an additional evaluation. I don't know exactly the time frame or the dates on that, but that would give you four per year, so a lot of windows of opportunity to participate in genomic program, adding the phenotypes or those weights and measures. <laughs> so in working with the association, we've got a couple of new traits I just want to mention to you. Uh, you've seen uh, Bain Wilson gave a lot of good lists of traits for consideration for you as well as your customers <coughs> in terms of gen genetic improvement. We've got some new trait development in terms of data collection on docility and then utter quality traits as well. So I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, in terms of <coughs> docility, we know that has a tremendous economic impact through our industry that carries through to that harvest point. 
There's breed organizations that already have docility EPDs available. Uh, North American Limousine Foundation did the first work uh, really here in the, the U.S. in terms of reporting uh, a temperament type genetic prediction. A uh, heritability estimate for docility is somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4, 30 to 40 percent genetics, the rest being environment, of course. In terms of a preferred docility scoring system, that's usually a one to six, and that's what uh, the Beef Improvement Federation <coughs> guidelines would recommend. Uh, it's a categorical type approach. You would measure it indi individually on calves in a, you'd again have a contemporary group of calves. Do that as a shoot score on a weaned calf. One to six, one's the most favorable, Six, not so good. And so working with these, you're able to report these docility scores online now, as well as on <coughs> your forms if you use those as well. So we don't have any data right now at the association to determine uh, that genetic component or the heritability estimate, but I sure think we can begin to uh, ramp up on some data collection. And we're working with David Hobbs to get more information out in the, the journal on this. And this is just an example of a drop-down menu for that uh, weaning docility shoot score to be reported. <coughs> it's skewed data, something to think about. So one's most favorable. And I'm just talking distribution-wise in terms of skewed. There's a you know, you see a whole lot of ones turned in, a few twos, less threes in cattle populations when docility scores are reported. So people try to think, well, isn't it a bell-shaped curve and most of it's in the middle, but this <coughs> scoring system, you want to make sure that you use it correctly. So one's <coughs> most favorable, just like your calving scores, one's most favorable as well. So. So just some new information along those lines. <coughs> We've also done some periodic reports in terms of utter quality traits. I was real uh, amazed to see how much breeder information has been turned in on utter scores at the Charlet Association, and those uh, scores are warehoused, <coughs> uh, breeder reported scores. You can report those online or on the worksheet with that two-digit code system that you're familiar with. Uh, American Hereford Association did really the first U.S. release utter EPD suspension and teat size. That heritability estimates about 25 percent. The Charlet database was over 40,000 observations. Uh, we were able to estimate those genetic parameters. Again, uh, heritability of, I think, 0.25 on suspension and 0.23 uh, for the teat size. So indicates that selection can be effective for those traits. This is just a graph, a big picture. <coughs> the, the black bars are the 2017 data by those utter suspension scores, one to nine. And then in 2018, you see some additional growth in the reported scoring at the association. So that was just a report that we did at a recent Breed Improvement Committee meeting. So breeders are continuing to turn in the information. Sometimes with a new trait, you'll have a big growth of data reported and then it'll just kind of fall off. But we're seeing more and more participation in that. I think we generated about um, in a kind of a prototype genetic evaluation and over 70,000 um, utter quality EPDs. So you'll see more about that moving forward, but just some nice research that's going on at the association with good data that you all are reporting, and, and we appreciate that. So just bringing this section to a, to a close, you have a, a wealth of cattle evaluation tools at your fingertips to put in place to make genetic progress and to become a train the trainer type scenario with your commercial customers as well and good exchange of information and scenarios to make that genetic progress. Don't overlook in the era of DNA 
the importance of that performance information that you're submitting to the association. Think a little bit more about submitting uh, more yearling trait information. I think that will work well for us moving forward and maybe give us an advantage in terms of de developing some additional selection tools, perhaps on the cow side. Uh, DNA tests, an additional piece of information, it's not going away, it's relevant, it adds reliability to your genetic predictions, and so uh, performance data matters, the DNA component is a nice piece that we've been able to add and implement, and so I think it's a great opportunity for us. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Try to see what type of additional Questions items for you Sally. want to hear. Now is your chance. Hear? Yes, ma'am? Uh, why do y'all adjust the calves birth weight? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those birth weight adjustments are utilized for those ratios that are reported back to you. When you submit data, you probably receive a ratio of which calves are heavier than the other ones, above 100 or below 100. And that's where that age of dam adjustment is used. It's small, but it's well documented in the industry across the breeds. Most of those are pretty similar. They typically don't exceed, you know, five or six pounds across you the breeds. Send one in line for 70 pounds and they'll put it 80. And that's what I don't understand. The birth weight is the birth weight. In terms of putting those females on an equal playing field, the literature would suggest that there is an age of dam adjustment that can be utilized for birth weight to get them on an equal genetic playing field mm -hmm. that is applied. And so you see that then ultimately when those calves are ratioed. You know, if you've turned in 15 calves and they'll show you the ones above 100 and below 100. Now when those birth weights are utilized to compute the EPDs, that contemporary group definition is much more particular in terms of the season that they were born, if there was an additional birth management, as well as sex of calf, male calves heavier than female calves, which you'd know. Okay, thank you. Donnie? Oh, excuse me. What is the value for those creek feeding in terms of months or weeks or something? Why isn't there a place where it could be longer or shorter? Could you? Uh, uh, the question is in terms of the creep feeding, coating, if there could be more refinement in terms of that being specified as these were fed longer than the other set of calves. I think the important part is consistency, whether they are creep fed or not creep fed, yes or no. And then if you feel like there is a set of calves that were creep fed longer than another and that has impacted the weights you're going to turn in, then you need to give them an additional group code to break them off. That's how I would initially do it, as opposed to giving different links and days of creep fed and all the breeders trying to utilize that type of scale. I would just add an additional group code if you think you have a set of creep fed calves and it's impacting that weight data that you turn in, that they're all managed alike. It certainly should impact if you feed them another month. Right, and so you're, as a breeder, you're responsible for breaking those contemporary groups appropriately so you didn't have the short creep fed in with the long creep fed and it biasing their weights to ultimate, ultimately be used in the EPDs. So, so I think you have that ability with a group so, code. So the way you would do that, Sally, would be, let's say that uh, the group that's the shorter creep fed you would sign, a, say they're group one, mm -hmm. and then those longer creep fed, you just make those a separate group as I two. Just give them a different group code. And put them in that, mm -hmm. so then they would, the long, the long creep fed would be in the two, the other would be in the one. Yep, you, I think you've got a group you code. Do, you do have a group you code. Have a group option, but you don't have anything that tells you where yep. you Yeah, but that's. Said. And that's It'll still break them. He, that's yeah. what she's telling them. That'll so still if you break have them. 40 calves and you end up breaking them 20 and 20 because of that specific <clears throat> management that you know that makes them different in terms, then you have that uh, ability to report it, and, and you need to. I mean, that's what makes your EPDs good, okay, critical. And it, it applies on, you know, some other traits, too. And... We see that come in on a variety of traits, different group codes. 
good question. That's that a is good a good question. That's great. a great one. Another great. question for Sally. So I have um, 20 bulls, and uh, they're all born, born about the same time, and some of them are just really good AI sires, and um, I'd like for them to look really good, but then I've got some of that bunch are just, they're pretty sorry. They're not very good at all. And uh, so I'm thinking about just not turning in anything on those sorry ones because I want those good ones to look really good. So That's if I cool. if I follow my scenario, what do I what have I just done? You created selection bias. That's <laughs> what you've done. A classic a classic I want to say blunder, that seems so No, severe. I'd say it's blunder. <laughs> But you want to completely report a set of calves. It's very important in terms of the appropriateness of the data for the national cattle evaluation. And it's to their benefit because they need, you actually want all those bulls competing against each other. You have a larger contemporary group size, very relevant and important.